Uh, good evening, uh, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, and welcome to the latest Abolitionist Approach webinar. Uh, once again, Gary Francione and Anna Charlton will be uh, talking some uh, about some questions relative to uh, or relating to the Abolitionist Approach and a vegan advocacy in general. And uh, later on in the webinar, we'll be taking your questions. So for the moment, it's good afternoon, Gary and Anna. Hello, Alan. Hi, Alan. How are you? I'm fine. How are you both? Good. Fine, thank, thank you. you. So, sorry. Um, you know, we, we try all, all, very hard to remember to get a decent camera. Um, and we actually did have one this week, but I can't get it to work with the laptop. I don't know why. Uh, we have Windows 10. We just got Windows 10 on the computer. It's not working. So we have this, uh, this uh, sort camera. Of fuzzy thing. Yeah, it's sort of fuzzy. Sorry about that. Oh, that's okay. You're looking. You're looking a little like a ghostly presence at the moment. Mm. It's, it's, it's not too bad, really. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, it's the spirit of abolitionism. Yes, it's a, exactly. It's the spirit of abolitionism. Okay. Well, to get us to get us going, um, uh, I noticed that there's uh, there's been a few additions to the abolitionist approach and how do I go vegan websites this week in terms of uh, new abolitionist resources, pamphlets, and so on. Yeah, very uh, exciting. Like to talk to us about them. Uh, we have six dogs in this room, and two of them are busy wrestling with each other. So we hope that that will not spread. Um, but, uh, yeah, we have five new pamphlets um, that were designed um, by Frances McCormick. Uh, I believe you know her. And, uh, yes, and she, did a, she did a very fine job. And I'd like to go through them briefly. Uh, oh. Because I think they're really good advocacy tools. This is my, they're all great. I think they're all great. This is, in certain ways, my favorite. This is the, and I'm sorry, I have a, I, in addition to a, my, my computer not uh, dealing well with my camera, I have an Epson printer, which I hate. It's one of the few, <laughs> it's one of the few inanimate objects that I have really, that I really despise. It's horrible. I hate it. Um, but in any event, uh, this is the, um, it, it's really quite nice looking, but you're not going to see They're all beautiful. Yeah. Yeah, uh, this is the fast food plan. Can you hold? Can you hold it up further, further towards the centre between you and Anna, so everyone can see it? There we go. That's better. That's great. That's great. All right. Now, this is a terrific tool because you know you oftentimes when you're doing vegan advocacy, people don't know. You know they say, "Well, gee, what am I going to eat? I don't know. It's also overwhelming." This is a seven-day plan of simple, inexpensive, wholesome, nutritious. Vegan food, Maggie. Please stop this. I'll take her out um, she doesn't down. Yes, and um, and and it's really quite. It's this is, I think, such a useful thing to have when you're having the conversation with somebody who is not a vegan and someone who's intimidated by veganism, who says, um, "I don't know what to do." It's also overwhelming, and you have this pamphlet to say, "No, it's not. It's easy. It's simple. Here it is, all laid out for you. You know, you can follow this plan." Um, you know, and and um, it's really it's it's fantastic. It's fantastic. And it has you know, it has a link uh, the how do I go vegan website on it. Yes. And it, I, this is I'm just delighted about this because people have been told that veganism uh, requires you know a strange and difficult and expensive diet. Right. And I think you need to be able to tell people you're excited about this you you want to make that commitment yeah. what are you going to eat tonight Absolutely. and i think if they if they're stumped by what they're going to eat tonight because they don't realize often that they're eating vegan food already there are many vegan choices right there in their own kitchen for them to eat that evening you might lose them you might lose that moment of of, of new commitment so i am just delighted that um, advocates will have this to hand out um, they're going to have whatever degree of follow-up they want to have with people they may have spoken to. But this gives people something to go home to, something that's sort of comforting and reassuring that says, yes, I can do this, and this is my plan for this week, and I'll work out all the details of conveniences and preferences and all that along the way. But this is, yeah, how do I go vegan today practically in their hands? And this, it's, it's, it's really reduces the anxiety. That's the thing. You right. know, it's like people say, I'm overwhelmed. And you say, no, I can't there, do this. there's no need to be overwhelmed. It's really quite easy. Here it is. Here's the pamphlet. And then go to howdoigovegan.com. I, I, will, I will say, uh, oh, sorry, I will say that I have actually tried every single one of those recipes in that leaflet. And they're all great. 
Great. Well, yeah, I mean, they're all Francis's recipes. Um, <laughs> and anyway, um, okay, the next pamphlet is Why Abolitionist Veganism? Because, you know, there's veganism and then there's abolitionist veganism. And, um, you know, that's what we promote. And it has uh, six principles. And it's not just a question of veganism, but it's a way of thinking about veganism a, a, and a, a theory of veganism. And that's the pamphlet, Why Abolitionist Veganism? Okay. Again, it has the link to, yeah. to howdoigovegan.com, yeah. so you've got both the theory and the practical help right. together. And then vegan nutrition, a lovely, look at the Gorgeous. colors. That it's is, absolutely I'm got. open it up. That is yeah. just, I mean, people would want to open that and read it, wouldn't they? Indeed. If you're indeed. sitting on the bus reading that, don't you think people would want to look at that more? I think that's such an appealing pamphlet. Yeah, and it's nice because, you know, you, you oftentimes have that conversation with people say, yeah, but... You know, if I go vegan, I will die. I will not, you know, I will not get good nutrition. I will be, you know, I, I, I will be weak. I will become ill. And <laughs> and you've got your, you know, you've got your, your pamphlet right here. to And, and, it, and it also points them to, um, you know, various other sites that they can, uh, where they can get information about nutrition. Nice, very nice job here. Then um, being fair means going vegan. Part of what vegan advocacy about is about is presentation of veganism uh in simple ideas you know i mean really this is not rocket science i mean this is just being vegan means you don't beat up on animals you don't victimize vulnerable innocent beings just because you can because you know you're able to do it because you're stronger or because you know you're just more horrible in terms of your moral nature and you're able to do stuff and it, it's just it's a, it's a nice it's a it's a nice pamphlet to get people to think about um what veganism means and so you know we've got we, we all want to be fair what does that mean animals suffer because we use them being fair means going vegan simple ideas but just getting people to focus on these simple moral ideas. This is um, this is made from a an essay Anna and I did a few years ago that we got a tremendous reaction to in a European magazine, um, and it's called "In Under Five Minutes." We'll show you that you're committed to veganism. So basically, um, the point of this of that article was to say, look, we all think that it's wrong to inflict unnecessary suffering on animals. Uh, and and yet, you know, we all consume animals and we all use them in situations which are transparently frivolous and not necessary. And so we all believe or most of us believe that it's wrong to inflict unnecessary suffering on animals. Well, that commits us to veganism. And that was the point of that was the point of that article, which Francis has now um, made into a pamphlet. And it's it's pretty good. And basically, uh, that's this, that's sort of a conversation you can have with somebody. Absolutely, that's written down, but you could have it verbally. And those are the convers sorts of conversations that we set out in the advocate advocate for animals book as model conversations that could form the basis of ones that people would feel comfortable having with when they uh, do their advocacy. So this is a fantastic resource of <laughs> people. I'm so uh, grateful you know, that they were done. And and look. Um, have these print these things out put them in offices where you're sitting you know in doctor's offices and 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 uh, obviously people don't want you to do that but i mean people leave literature in places all the time leave leave this literature in places when you're on the bus ostentatiously take out a pamphlet and read it um no, i mean it doesn't i mean you can you, there's a bit of theater involved in all this stuff right non-animal book give me a brochure here you see you just use it as a bookmark so you're reading your thing and you take it out and you're holding your book and like this you know i mean it's if you know, you're on a train for example and you're you know you take your book room, out you're you in, take on you, the bus, you're, you're on a train you're, someone's sitting across from you right you take out your book watch you, the eyes go to you remove pamphlet. you remove the thing and then you're reading the book you're holding that up and someone says are you vegan mm. Well, yes. How did you know? Um, and and then you've got uh, you can have a conversation. So I, I think these, you know, that we have the abolitionist approach pamphlet, which um, which is also available online, which talks about the six principles. And um, that's now in 
uh, I don't know, 14, no, 20, 20 some odd different languages. It's in a lot of different languages. So whatever language it is that you speak, I mean, we don't have all the languages, but most of the languages that, um, you know, that, that, that you might want to access a pamphlet to, you can get on, on our website approach.com all these pamphlets are on abolitionistapproach.com and how do i go vegan.com and they're all free and you know all you have to do is just print them out and there you go so i'm really excited about these things i'm grateful to francis for doing them and um you know they're really useful advocacy tools and and remember something each of us you know the uh, an idea will come back to again and again and again and again and again each of us if we're going to change the world each of us has got to participate. This isn't a situation of, hey, you do it. It's a question of, we all have to do it. And these sorts of resources make that a lot easier. No, I was, I, 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 sorry. Oh, sorry, Anna. I understand that these new pamphlets are also available in Spanish. Is that correct? Yes, yes. Oh, are they all, are they all in Spanish? I know that I, one of them. Are they all in Spanish? Not, not yet, but they will be. Okay, yes. Um, yeah. uh, yes, Christina Kuypers, who is heading up our Spanish language division um, with uh, three other people, three right now, but we hope more. Uh, and she's in the process of, um, of generating a lot of literature in Spanish. Uh, she's helping with and indeed is, uh, is, is uh, 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 heading up the how do I go vegan dot com Spanish project. And um, so, yeah, they'll all I mean, I, I know I, I th one or two of them. I know is in Spanish. Christine has already done, um, but but I, uh, I I assume she's working on all of them, and she's also going to be getting um, uh, uh, the animal rights, the abolitionist approach. Um, that's going to be out in another few weeks. She's just checking the translation that was originally uh, made, and she's making a few changes here and there, and she's going to get that out. Uh, I, I'm hoping shortly. But we're very excited because the number of people who speak Spanish is huge. Oh, sure. And you know, and, and there are very few resources. And there are very few there are very few Spanish, resources so. presently available. So we're going to try to remedy mm. that. That's great. Well, thanks for that. We'll um, we'll move on now and uh, and uh, get you to, to answer some questions. Um, to get us started, we've got one or two from previous webinars, and it could give people who are viewing this webinar a chance to, to get involved and ask a few questions. Uh, something you just said leads me on very nicely to the first question. Uh, you were talking about uh, everybody should go out and uh, be a leader. Everyone should go out and do advocacy. Uh, and we have a question from, uh, from Taylor. I don't know where Taylor is from because we didn't get those details. But Taylor says uh, she's very busy with work and family life. And she has little time to do advocacy herself. Is donating to support full-time activists money well spent? Uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> like, no. Um, I think actually that's a very bad thing to do. Um, if we want to change the world, each of us has to participate. Now, we'll all have different ways of participating. And we'll all do different sorts of things but we all need to do those things and don't underestimate just because you're not speaking to large numbers of people because your audience is basically the people you work with or the people you go to school with or your circle of family and friends i keep saying if everybody who is presently vegan gets one other person in the next year to go vegan and we all did that the world would be vegan in about 15 years the entire planet it's not going to happen but it, it the the exponential power um you know of of a movement i mean a, you know of individuals doing things of a grassroots movement um the the ability to really exponentially uh uh extend the uh, the idea and the and and, and you know the theory is it, 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 it is incredible so just get out there and do it and it's really important and i think it's a very bad idea and then it's sort of related, Alan, to the con the problem of what we're seeing right now. Activism, all social movements go through periods. And we're in this period right now, what I call instant activism, where um, people are not expected to educate themselves so that they can go out and educate others. They just need to show up and be, be part of some show, some uh, spectacle. And whether it's 
showing up and witnessing uh, and stopping a truck on the way to the slaughterhouse or whether it's going into a restaurant and you know yelling it's not food it's violence or whether it's standing in a geometrical shape wearing a mask holding a computer showing slaughterhouse footage or whatever the present the, the, the present approach to animal activism is characterized by what I call instant activism. Don't worry about it. You don't have to learn anything. You don't have to know a damn thing. Just show up and be a prop in someone else's show. That's a recipe for disaster, particularly when the someone else doesn't know what the hell he or she is talking about, which is often the case with these, these events, uh, or where the message that's given is incredibly confused. So, you know, if you've got people who are the, the people who are speaking are not terribly educated or knowledgeable about the theory of abolition um, and you have people who are standing there as props for, you know, the spectacle who don't know anything, then it, it really it, this is really just not a very, very good idea. And so and what, what and that sort of feeds into this idea that, well, you don't need to know anything. You just show up and you know, have somebody who's paid to be an activist, a professional activist, a careerist, be the person who's, you know, uh, uh, running the show, either, you know, at the local level or there's somebody sort of, you know, on, on the national level who sort of uh, is, is, is controlling the content of the, of the message. And I, I'm telling you, we have been doing this now for, I don't know, 30, I guess, since we since we went vegan. So, you know, uh, we weren't really sort of active before 1982 ish or so. Um, but I've never seen that work out well, whenever you have the, I mean, the, the, as a matter of fact, the, one of the main reasons why the movement has failed, there's a bunch of reasons, but one of the main reasons why is because of careerists, because of people who are, you know, who have this as a, as a job, and go to the public and say, give me money so that I can do this. Well, you know, you don't need to, you know, this is not rocket science. If you go to the public and you ask them to fund your speech, basically what happens is you end up saying the things that you think your donors want to hear. And um, in a world where veganism is a minority position and abolitionist veganism is is an even smaller segment within the general vegan category. You're not going to get a whole lot of people who are going to, you know, going to want you to to promote the abolitionist message. They're going to want you to promote the well. You know, I don't want to be judgmental, and if you want to eat cage-free eggs, and it's okay, that that's the sort of message you're going to you're going to you're going to promote. And we we really do need to be redefining what advocacy is absolutely because i think we're in still in the early days of, mm -hmm. of vegan advocacy certainly abolitionist vegan advocacy a lot of us have come to realize the problems of the large charities and them being the face of uh, people who are interested in in animal issues at whichever point they're at there's no we're not making progress if we just then replace it with another sort of structure that's at arm's length and separate from everyone else's lives. I, I, I repeat what I always say, that I am confident that the most important sort of activism, the most effective advocacy, is people talking one on one with people in their community, with their sphere of influence at, at work and within their own families, Absolutely. at their church, at their school or something. Because if people know you and have confidence that you're an otherwise decent person, they are much more open to what you're saying than if you're standing apart from them, if you're criticizing them, if you're going at, you know, people recoil and stand back if you're either yelling at them, if you're asking, if they, if you're asking them for money, um, anything that sets them apart, anything that makes them take that literal step or emotional or an intellectual step back. We want people to engage on it and have an opportunity to follow up. This is the history of other movements. This is this is how um, change came on race and uh, other issues. Heaven knows we have a long way to go, but that's how the important changes in society happened. And that's how 
they will happen here. Uh, I, I was so pleased this morning, I'll tell you a little anecdote. I got an email this morning from my friend Marlene Watson Terra, and she runs that wonderful macro vegan website that we um, uh, feature so often on the abolitionist approach website. And anyone who has um, uh, questions on, on uh, nutrition should go and see the work that Marlene Watson Terra and her spouse, Bill Terra, do. Fantastic resource. But she, she sent me a picture of her 92 year old mother who has gone vegan and is now an activist and advocate at 92. And she's out there talking about it. She's a wonderful example for everyone because she's so excited and bright and enervated. Um, who wouldn't want to be like Marlene's mother at 92? But Most she, of us will be just happy to be alive vegan at 92. She's treats with people. <laughs> And what was I saw this morning her um, given uh, back and forth with a group of women in Detroit who were inspired by her. I mean, you don't know where what your impact is going to be. So a quick shout out to Marlene's mother today. Thank you. <laughs> I'm, I'm hope I'm in that good shape at 92. Uh, heaven knows I'll still be advocating if there's a breath in my body. But I hope by then we will have made some more progress because everybody will have taken on the individual responsibility of doing that. Now, Taylor, I, I can imagine, has got a busy schedule and she's got work commitments and family commitments, but she talks to people. She meets people. She has friends and relatives and she has the opportunity to influence them. And, and she's hey, got, she's now got. she's got a bunch of new <laughs> uh, flyers for people. So... Advocacy isn't, you know, standing in the street necessarily. It isn't tabling necess necessarily. It's everyday conversations because being an abolition abolitionist vegan is the core of who you are. So that's what you present to the world. You know, what was interesting was um, I recently, somebody sent me a video of, of a guy giving a talk in an Australian university and he's asked about, the abolitionist approach and he says well you know the problem with abolition is that it they're not trying to change society they're just trying to change people one at a time and this is a guy who's promoting welfare reform <laughs> and promoting all sorts of nonsense and he say well we don't really want to change this we just want to change you know we just want to get people to go vegan one at a time and the answer is we want people to go vegan um and and you should never denigrate uh, the individual going vegan and you're, you know, you are getting an individual to go, you know, one person to go vegan. Because as I said, if we all did it and we did it year after year after year, then we would have a vegan world. And so, uh, but, but, you know, of course we're trying to change things. Of course we're trying to change society. What we're trying to do is change society in a way that the welfareists and that the single issue campaign people and all of the, you know, the, the instant activism branding spectacle people have failed to do it because basically, you know, they're doing something different. You know, we're, they're, they're focusing on something different. We're trying to get people to focus on a fundamental issue. It's unfair. It's unjust. It's morally wrong. And I want to say something, you know, I wrote about this this morning because I, this is something I get probably one of the most frequently uh, asked questions is, well, what, how do you deal with People who say, yeah, but you're being judgmental. And the answer is, well, of course I'm being judgmental. You can't do morality. There is no such thing as morality without judgments because morality is, you know, about making moral judgments. Now, we shouldn't be judging individuals. That's not our role. But we should be judging actions, institutions, practices. That's what we need to do. So you can't sort of say, well, you know, if you if you're opposed to racism, you're taking a moral position. You can't be opposed to racism without taking the position that being judgmental and saying discrimination based on race is immoral. And so, you know, of course, we're being judgmental. There's nothing wrong with being judgmental. As a matter of fact, there's everything right about being judgmental. As a matter of fact, one of the things that's really bad about society now is that people are afraid of being judgmental. People, people are afraid of making moral judgments and saying that's wrong because everybody has got their opinion. And the answer is, yeah, everyone's entitled to an opinion. Some people are just wrong. And, you know, yeah, you're entitled. You're entitled to your opinion that you think people of a particular race are inferior. You're entitled to your opinion. You're wrong. 
You know, you're entitled to think that women have great, have lesser moral value than men. You're entitled to that opinion, but you're wrong. You're entitled to think it's okay to exploit animals, but you're wrong. So it is a matter of, you know, of being judgmental, you know, and as I say, it's not a matter of being judgmental about individuals and going up and saying that they're evil people or they're terrible. I mean, but it is a matter of being judgmental and saying something is wrong. And, you know, I saw another video um, of... Oh, I think judgmental is the wrong word. You're not putting... I mean, it has connotations... Well, you're making of judgment. putting somebody down, you know? Right. Well, um, you're, you're, so you're, but you're, you're making a judgment right. about behavior, saying right. that one, one thing is better than another. Right. So the other one tends to be wrong in that case. But, but what's also important to remember, I think, in the vegan concept uh, context is that a lot of people haven't been exposed to a good presentation about what veganism is. So they haven't had an opportunity to really engage it as they would other ethical principles. So I'm quite happy at this point in, in society to say, um, if you've got racist or misogynist, uh, misogynistic ideas, um, I'm going to criticize you for that. Um, but most people haven't had a good conversation with someone about veganism, haven't had it presented in, a, in an uplifting and positive and, and uh, accurate way. And they haven't been shown how it's possible for, the, for them to integrate those principles in their own life. They think it's weird and strange and difficult and they'll die and they won't get enough nutrition and it's expensive and all those things. So that's where the individual person can be so important about giving a new perspective on what veganism is. And I want to encourage everybody to do it because everybody can. Everyone gets nervous and shy and thinks, ah, I can't do that and it's for someone else. But this isn't for us to be, you know, the audience clapping for someone on stage who inspires you at a conference or something and sends you home gung-ho for something that lasts for 15 minutes and then you settle back into inertia and not contacting people. It's a responsibility that every single one of, of us has. And some days you're going to be more satisfied with what you did and you'll come home to think, oh, I could have done that better. So what happens? Next week you go out and make, have that conversation and you do it better and it becomes easier and it becomes uh, clearer and we all become better advocates. But it's okay to stumble over your words. It's okay to say, you know, I need, I need a moment so I can explain myself properly or even have a follow up with someone if they're willing to have a phone or email exchange with someone or it's someone you meet again at work the next day or something. So everyone can have confidence that they can do it because it's our individual obligation. But it's also our individual ability. Uh, but I want to I go back to the idea, though, of being judgmental, because what is happening, I think, more is this idea that People think that there's something wrong with saying there's something wrong with animal exploitation. Oh, right, right. And that I think we've got to be really clear about. I mean, I, I, I think it's a very bad idea to be judgmental with respect to individuals. I, I mean, I think, you know, in, the, in, you know, calling people Nazis, I mean, calling people Nazis in any context is not exactly a lead to, you know, happy conversations. Um, and, you know, but, but, but saying to people, well, you know, you're not a vegan, so you're like a child molester or something like that. That's not useful. Um, and, you know, making those sorts of judgments about people, you basically have the moral value of child molester. It's not really useful. It is important to talk about how animal exploitation is, is, is a, a violation of fundamental rights in the way that other forms of rights violations uh, are violations of rights, like child molestation or murder or other sorts of things. But there are differences because, as Anna mentioned before, uh, animal exploitation is so much a part of the society that people really haven't thought about it in any meaningful way so um, or any clear way. And the animal groups haven't helped them do that, by the way. Uh, if anything, they've gotten them more confused about it. So, you know, it's really important to not be judgmental about individuals, but it is important to be judgmental about the actions practices and institutions of animal exploitation. I saw another video uh, where 
you know, is one of these uh, these uh, cube things where uh, there's a fellow eating ice cream while he's being, you know, while while someone's talking to him. And um, uh, and, and, and the, the, the guy makes the point while he's eating the ice cream that he thinks he's being hypocritical. And the person he's talking to uh, sort of said, well, no, 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 you're fine, you're fine, it's fine. It's important to sort of say, you know, look, that thing that you're eating, if you really care about animals, what you're eating is every bit as bad as meat. It's a horrible idea. It really results in dreadful, uh, not that any commodification is not dreadful, but dreadful commodification of cows and 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 objectification and commodification of their relationship with their babies and stuff. I mean, it's dreadful. You know, the whole the veal industry. The, you know, the veal industry exists because it's a dairy industry. Every I mean, ice cream. You know, we tend to think of it as an innocuous, you know, food, a great summertime food. Kids love it and stuff like that. It's horrible. It's absolutely horrible. And so it's it's important to. You know, again, you don't want to say to the guy, I'm not going to talk to you because you're eating an ice cream cone and I, you know, I think you're evil and I think you're a Nazi and I think you're a child molester. That's not useful. But we ought not to shy away from the idea that, um, you know, that we ought to be clear with people and, you know, be very clear with people and not sort of, you know, excuse it and say, well, that's okay. You know, don't worry about it. You know, you're fine. No, it's not fine. And I think we ought to be clear about that. And whenever, when somebody's willing to engage us, never, ever, 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 ever be anything but 100% clear. Okay. All right. Thanks for that. Um, back to the, uh, this instant activism thing. We've got a supplementary question here from Anne who's in the room with us tonight. Um, Anne says, what evidence can you provide to convince people who think that this loud activism is the best way to change people's minds? I'm sorry. Convince them that uh, it is or isn't. I don't think it is the best way to change. No, what, what, sorry, what, what, what can you do to convince people who think that, that it's not? Well, I mean, as far, it depends on this, what we're talking about. I mean, with the say, the stuff about the, the witnessing of the slaughter, I, I, I think, I think the, the business about witnessing slaughterhouse, the, 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 you know, stopping the trucks on the way to the slaughterhouse to quote witness, um, be witnesses or whatever for the animals. I think that's positively harmful um, to animals. And I've I've had people say to me, well, you know, but the animals really, they know you're trying to bond with them. And it's, but I have news for you. Animals in a truck on the way to the slaughterhouse are terrified. People who believe that um, they're stopping the trucks and they're sticking their hands in the in the trucks or or offering the animals water or crying while they're taking selfies and stuff that stuff does not help animals. That just increases it. It prolongs the time that they are in utter terror, and uh, and I think it's I think it's really very harmful. I, I think that whole save phenomenon um, it disturbs me because it is so incredibly counterproductive. And so much about the individuals involved. It's about, and again, I'm, I'm not saying these people aren't sincere and, or that they're bad people. I'm just saying I think they're wrong. And I think that, um, you know, that they're, that they're, um, that they're uh, not, that they're not uh, taking into account that they're dealing with animals who are terrified and they're prolonging that terror. And they're not really, you know, they're not really the, the idea that they're comforting the animals or that they're they're doing something positive for the animals. That's a fantasy. That's a complete fantasy that they're talking themselves into, that they're somehow, you know, they're, they're somehow being the angel, you know, that, the, the, you know, the, the last positive um, experience these animals have. That's just crazy, frankly. Um, well, I think it's uh, sorry. I think I think what it is, is that people who people who favor activism like um, cubes and disruptions and uh, these uh, uh, bearing witness and so on, they, they do say, well, these things make people go vegan. People go vegan because of them. And I think this is, I think they think that this is the most effective way to make people go vegan, as opposed to the kind of vegan education you're talking about, or we're talking I'm, about. I'm sure they can point to someone who's gone vegan because of that. You can I mean, point to almost, somebody who's gone vegan. Almost because, anything. <laughs> for and, anything, you know, right. Good, good or bad experiences can can have uh, you know uh, results. The point is, what is the most effective and the most efficient and the most lasting way of, of 
of uh, influencing people. And I, I do understand how the um, recognition that of the necessity of going uh, vegan is can be a very emotional thing. And, um, you know, you look back and you think, how on earth could I have ever <laughs> participated in this? And, right. and you want to shed everything that you've ever done and thought about. You've got some guilt for perhaps for the years that you've done it. You want to tell your family about it. You want to tell, I want they, you want them to agree with you. Yeah. You don't understand why they don't. There's a, there's a lot of raw emotion right on the surface. So I, I can understand how it kind of le often leaves us flailing around trying to attach that to something that you think is going to make a difference. And, um, and, and so, uh, really like an action that mirrors the rawness of, of the emotions that can be involved in this. But I think we need to always focus on, on what's involved here and the fact that we are here to represent um, the interests of animals um, who, who are the victims here. And so we ha can have strong emotions, but we're not the victims. And I think we need to get ourselves out of the center of this theater and do the hard work and sometimes exercise some self-restraint and um, do the plodding everyday work of, of, of uh, changing attitudes about veganism. It's not always exciting. It doesn't involve theater. It's not a, you know, an afternoon's entertainment sometimes, even though, um, you know, it, it involves crying and, and, uh, and, and strong emotions. It's, it's not, it's not all get together and do, do an event. It's stay home, learn something, practice something, go talk to somebody. Um, I think that's really where we'll get uh, a, a better result. I, I think one of the really serious problems, though, is all that all that quote activism. Again, encourage you know. It encourages people to not be activists activists themselves. So they can go to the save event, or they can go to the you know the direct action everywhere or, you know mm -hmm. event, or to the uh, whatever event, the cube event, and they haven't learned that. These are people, they, they haven't educated themselves, so they're not capable of talking to people. Uh, and I've had experiences of talking with some of these folks after these events or at these events. And most of them don't know any, I mean, you know, they're, they're, they're confused. They're confused. And, um, you know, people need to educate themselves. What we're dealing with is a paradigm that has existed for thousands of years. And it's deeply ingrained. And I mean, animal exploitation is a deeply, you know, rests on some uh, anthropocentric views, which are very, very deeply ingrained in our thinking. And if we're going to upset those, if we're going to, if we're going to, you know, uproot them and replace them with something else, we need to have some powerful tools. We need to, um, you know, we need to be educated. We need to educate ourselves. And Part of what all of these forms of activism do is to encourage people not to do that. So just show up, you know, hey, you want to have like, you know, say Saturday afternoon, you got nothing better to do? Well, show up and let's stand in a geometrical pattern or, you know, come on over and let's witness at the slaughterhouse or, you know, or or let's go into a restaurant. And I mean, I, I have to tell you, um, you know, when I see these things, these videos where people are sitting in a restaurant and then they order human, you know, like the, 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 the service person, you know, the, the uh, service person goes up and takes their order and they start saying, well, I want a human leg or I want this or I want that. And then they proceed to scream and fall over. I mean, all that does is reinforce the view that veganisms are not vegans are nuts. Um, you know, and, and, and we don't want, I mean, why do we want to reinforce that view? I mean, I understand the idea that what we want to do is get people thinking about stuff, but you're not what you, you don't get people thinking in there. Well, some people think, yeah, yeah. So, I mean, I don't want to say no one will think, but as a general matter, that is not a productive way of educating people. This is something that is not going to be changed by, you know, falling over in a restaurant screaming or showing somebody a gory photo. Do you think people have never seen gory photos of animal exploitation? They, I mean, they, they, you know, I realize some people think that these things came into existence last week, but you know, these, the, you know, the gory, the gory stuff's been around forever, and we still don't have a vegan world. So, like this idea that well, when people see the footage, you know, I mean, 
one of the problems with, with a lot of that stuff is people see the footage. If they haven't really thought through the issue and no one's educated them, they see the, the, the footage and their first reaction is to say, well, that we got we to gotta stop that. We got to somehow change that. And then that's exactly why we have a welfare movement. You know, that's exactly why we have a welfare movement. Okay, thanks very much. I mean, I suppose that the, uh, the bottom line of all this is that nobody ever went vegan unless somebody spoke to them about veganism. Um, yeah, so exactly. Why not, exactly. Why not cut out the middleman and go cut directly to the chase? Exactly. Yeah. Okay, right, complete change of topic now. This is a question from Shamil, who says, I've noticed that quite a few vegans strongly support so-called clean meat. How should abolitionists respond when they're asked about this stuff? Clean meat ain't vegan. <laughs> Clean meat involves uh, basically um, taking cells from animals, growing them in 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 media that ha that are made, you know, that, that consists of animals, and um, so it's not it's not vegan. First of all, um, secondly, it just reinforces this whole idea that somehow if we don't have meat, we're deprived. Um, Thirdly, I do not understand. I saw an essay recently um, written by my friend Phil Wollen in Australia. And I like Phil very much. But I think Phil's just dead wrong on this. He talks about how, well, you know, uh, people who are who don't want to go vegan, they'll respond to this, you know, to this this uh, cultured meat business. And And my view is, look. We already have tons of fake meat out there, you know, the, the the soy meats and the tempeh meats and all that sort of stuff. And anybody, you know, I mean, that hasn't resulted in a vegan world because, you know, it's not that, I mean, anybody who really wants to continue eating meat-like products because they like the texture or the flavor or whatever, the stuff that's out now is actually frightening. I don't eat that stuff. I mean, for lots of different reasons, one of which is it grosses me out because it's so much like meat. Um, that I don't, it makes me, it, it just, I find it nauseating. Um, but there's plenty of stuff out there and it's, it's, it's incredible in terms of it mocks the texture. I mean, mock meat, it mocks the texture, it mocks, mocks the flavor. I mean, it really is quite remarkable. And so to the extent that somebody says, look, you know, I just can't eat this vegetable stuff. It just not, you know, it, it just doesn't strike me as being, you know, I mean, I need something that I, you know, if I don't, I don't feel that I'm having, that I'm having a meal if I don't have something meat. Um, well, if that's your scene, then you got plenty of the fake meats to, to eat. Um, and so I don't think that, you know, that, that, that the cultured thing, the cultured meat is going to somehow be a magical answer. Um, I mean, I realize a lot of people are investing in that. There are a lot of animal people, including a lot of vegans who are investing money in that stuff. And, you know, and, and, um, some of them uh, have even gone into the business of making this stuff and using animal cells um, and 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 calf serum and stuff to grow the the, the, the cultures. And it's not vegan, you know. There, there, you know, this stuff. You, you can't. You have to have, an, you have a constant supply of animals from which you take the, the cells, and then you have to have some sort of medium in which the cells are cultured. All of this involves animals, but it's also reinforcing this whole idea. That somehow, you know, we're all deprived if we're not eating meat. We've got to get away from that. I mean, we really have to get away from that. And um, and I think, you know, um, the idea that we're ever going to have any supply of this stuff that's going to be in any way cost effective, um, it, you know, at some time in the near future is 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 fanciful. Um, and it wouldn't deal with, uh, you know, you're still going to have tons of animals being used for eggs and for dairy and things. I mean, it's just, it's not a solution to the problem. If people really feel that strongly about meat they have the mock meats that they can eat right now and they can go to the store and they can get those they don't need to they don't need they're not cultured they're not you know they're, they're not they don't involve you know killing animals um you know i i find them disgusting but if you like that sort of thing they're great yeah i think also of that uh, uh you know clean meat is is going to happen or not happen regardless of whether vegans sure. support right. it or not um right. we really don't need to compromise our ethics for uh, for that in any way, shape, or form. Yeah, um, yeah. I mean, exactly, exactly. exactly. And uh, the other thing that, that sprung to mind to when I was thinking about this was that uh, if we if we say, well, this there's a little bit of exploitation is okay in this instance. It's a bit of a slippery slope because when a bit, you can say, well, you know, a little bit of exploitation yeah. in some other areas okay, yeah. you know. Yeah. So uh, I think it's I think it's a dangerous thing to do, and we don't even need to do it, really, do we? Yeah. No. Um, 
But we have got a, a supplementary question from Maynard who says, what about clean meat to use as pet food? I think he's thinking of cats, obviously, another sort of carnivorous animal. Well, you know, first of all, you know, with dogs, there's no problem. So, I mean, let's just be clear about that. Um, six vegan dogs. You know, we have six <laughs> vegan dogs. and, and Some um, of whom are brought back from the brink. Exactly, you know, exactly. On a vegan diet, so um, they thrive. And uh, so that's, it's, there's no problem with dogs. And with most cats, is I, I mean, we have, we have lots of friends. We don't have any cats because when you have six dogs, having a cat in the house would, would it would be, would, would, more in, chaos. would increase the level of chaos even more than we presently have. Yeah. And um, uh, we did actually once rescue a cat um, from an abandoned house. Uh, we saw the cat and we, we went and we got the cat. And we had the cat in the house with uh, us for a few days when we had, I think, five dogs. Mm -hmm. And um, I, 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 it was unbelievable. And we actually had to put the cat in a room because it wasn't fair to the cat. The cat was being chased. <laughs> it, was, it was dreadful. And um, so I don't really know very much about cats. And we've never lived with cats apart from that brief time. Um, but we have plenty of friends who have cats. And they have vegan cats. Um, and you know, there's this idea that, um, some males will develop crystals and particularly males will develop crystals if they don't have vegan, if they have, don't have meat foods. Apparently from what I understand from my vet friends, um, some cats, male cats will develop crystals no matter what they eat because this is that just, they do that. Um, and you know, I mean, I think you have to be smart about it and that, you know, if you have cats and you're going to get them on a vegan diet. Um, you probably, I think you need to do some testing, you know, to make sure that the, you know, that they're, they're that their, um, you know, their, their acid alkaline ratios and, and, and whatnot are appropriate. But um, I, no, I, I, I don't think, I mean, I don't think we should be developing cultured meat for cats. I think what we ought to be doing is doing everything we can to get our cats on vegan diets. Um and not supporting yet another animal-based source of of stuff for cats. Um, I think we ought to we ought to we ought to do the the best we can to get our cats to be vegan. And I think, as I say, based on what I understand from my friends who have cats, um, it's possible most of the time. It may not be possible all of the time. In which case. I don't think it's ever morally justifiable to feed animals to other animals. It may be excusable in the sense that it's morally wrong, but what the hell are we supposed to do? In which case, my view is you buy the cheapest, <laughs> you buy the cheapest uh, cat food you can find because it's not, that stuff is generally not resulting in more animals being killed because it literally is slaughterhouse sweepings. But, but I do have to, I do have to say this. What I do not understand about this argument, that cats need meat. What they need is taurine. And in a lot of these cat foods that have, and as I understand it, in most of the canned cat foods, they have added taurine anyway because the meat's so over-processed. There, you know, there's no, there's no natural taurine in the meat anymore because it's been processed. So they add taurine. Well, you can get vegan taurine. So I don't understand this argument that um, I, I really don't. And again, I'm not a veterinarian and maybe I'm missing something here, but it seems to me that given that the taurine is supplemented anyway, because the meat-based foods are are so, or the fish-based foods or whatever, whatever feeding the animal is, is already so processed that the taurine that's, that exists is, is, is gone. So it has to be added, it has to be supplemented. I don't understand why it's any, different to take the vegan taurine and add it to the vegan food and um you know and the cats getting the toy now i we have friends who do that and who have perfectly healthy cats i mean my guess is and we've heard from some of them that there was a period of transition where you know it took a while for the cat to get used to it and i had to give the cat you know they had to wean the cat off of the meat foods and wean the cat onto the the vegan foods and stuff but i mean i know we have very few friends we have some who still feed meat or fish or whatever to their to their cats and you know and we all basically look at it the same way um it's not right it's wrong but it's like a lifeboat situation you know i mean animals make look 
Domesticated animals make moral messes that we can't clean up in a very tidy way all the time. And it's not right, um, you know, but sometimes you don't, you know, you don't really have choices. Okay. Right, complete change of subject now. Uh, this is a question from Marisol, uh, who says, um, there's a question about your Tom uh, Regan article. Yeah. Uh, Marisol says, why do you think that Tom rejected the rights position and embraced working with new welfareists? <laughs> well, that's interesting. Um, Tom, it's a long story. It's a long story, right? Tom, uh, Tom didn't reject. The short version. <laughs> yeah, Tom didn't reject the rights position. He did what he did do was that um, he 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 was of the view in the late nineties, uh, late eighties to the mid nineties, that there was an inconsistency. <coughs> excuse me, between that if you were a rights advocate, there were certain things you couldn't, you know, that, that basically the, the people who were promoting welfare reform or single issue campaigns of a, of a particular sort were not acting consistently with the rights position. And then um, in the article that I wrote uh, in Between the Species in which I discuss and actually to some degree document because I, I still have quite a few of... Uh, of, of that of those materials from those days um, but you know you see the transition where Tom you know Tom is basically very very much of the view that uh, rights advocates should not be working with welfareists and others and this was the position that he and I were taking this is where new welfareism comes from you know that basically the the, the rights people who are working um, for welfare reform and for other things, we call them new welfareists. I call them new new welfareists, and and he agreed with that very strongly. And then I think, um, you know, why did Tom change toward the later '90s uh, and start and start saying, well, you know, we can all work together? <laughs> Made no sense, given what he had said before. And the answer to that is, I don't know, and I will. And now Tom is is dead. I will never find out. Um, I suspect that what Tom was reacting to, I su suspect strongly, was that the reaction of animal people to the rights position and to the rejection of of um, of, of welfareism was was nasty. Animal people are some of you know can be really nasty people, and in part because. Um, uh, Many of them are consequentialists in the sense that they think that what they're doing is important. God, you know, it's God's work. And if somebody who dis somebody disagrees with them, they're harming animals. So it's okay to say whatever they want to say about them. That's for, that's a fairly common and unfortunate uh, fact about the animal movement. And it got nasty in the in the mid '90s when, um, because up until the mid '90s, there was a discussion going on. And um, and about rights versus welfare, and it was a real active discussion. Um, some things happened in '95 and '96 that changed that, and the larger organizations made it clear they didn't want to have that discussion anymore. So, um, and then things started getting um, ugly, and people started, you know, I mean, you see this sort of conduct with people in the movement these days. I mean, but you know, it was, it, it was a particular sort of nastiness directed. It was, it was, people just didn't want to have that discussion. They found it to be, um, they didn't want to have it. I mean, do you, do, would you agree? Uh, first of all, uh, I don't know if Marisol's read the article from Between the Species, but I would encourage her and anyone else who's interested in this to, to the link is on the abolitionist approach uh, Facebook page, certainly. And we can put that up again because this is really too much of a of a subject to deal with, you know, just in the webinar here. And um, I found it very interesting to read Gary's synopsis of that time because it was a, a, an important span of time um, and an important time for the movement. And it was a pivotal point in the, of the movement. But as Gary was saying, the American movement um, has always been underpinned by Peter Singer, a version of Peter Singer's utilitarian approach, because that has always been uh, provided a long list of animal welfare single issue <laughs> campaigns that the old groups and then the new groups could 
um, engage with and campaign on and fundraise off. So um, there's always been that tension between, between the groups who were saying, hey, this gives us something to work on, and um, the, the, the people who are taking a rights approach. So there's always been that tension. And um, as Gary was saying, um, there wasn't a great deal of welcoming for the people taking the rights position. There was among the, the, um, the grassroots activist people, but Absolutely. not with the organizations. No. And at that time, if, it, if this happened now, it might be different because there's different access, just like this webinar, you can reach people differently. But at the time, the groups had the stranglehold through their mailing lists and the, you know, the direct mail and the, uh, the large conferences and stuff. So they could, they could um, freeze people out and they tried very hard to do so. And it got nasty and it got predictably vicious. Um, and I think Tom Reagan found that very hard to deal with. So he made um, some decisions that I didn't agree with, and Gary will explain in his article why he didn't agree with it. it, it it's a shame because I think the movement could have been moved along further than it would. I think it would have been 20 years ahead of where it is now if it was at that time had no moved out differently. Yeah. But so that this is a big, a, a big um, vista that we're looking at of of what happened, and I would encourage people to to look at that article. It's very interesting in between the species. Yeah. It's a, it's a very interesting subject, not least of all, because uh, I, I get the impression that a lot of people who are who, who are engaged in the activism type of activism that we've been talking about have really not looked into the history of uh, animal rights. Absolutely, animal rights absolutely. <laughs> that and, is uh, the understatement of the uh, century. <laughs> oh, yeah, sorry about that. <laughs> uh, and and you know, it really is a good thing to know where where all this um, has been going on and how long it's been going on because. You know, it's, you, you get the impression that some people think that animal rights only started three years ago, you know, right. uh, and of course it didn't. It's been going, as you know, 40 years at least. Uh, yeah. and it's, a good, it's a good t subject for people to uh, to read up on. I think it's very worthwhile. Yeah, I mean, part, 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 of the, part of the problem is, is that people think, as you point out, know, is that, you know, this whole issue started last week. Mm. And, um, you know, so they say, well, you know, but you got to take, you know, you got to take steps or you got to do that, you know, or, how, you know, I mean, they're acting as if there ha there hasn't been, as you point out, you know, 30, 40 years of history about this. I mean, you know, people, have been, I remember, Alan, when I first got involved with this and the fur issue was the big, it was the, right. the big issue. The fur industry is stronger now than it was back then. And, you know, right. everyone was thinking, well, you know, you got to focus on fur. And I remember thinking, well, you know, what the hell is the difference between, I mean, even before I, I developed a lot of the, the stuff that I went on to develop, I, I would say, well, you know, I don't understand what's the difference between fur and leather and wool and stuff. And people would yell at me, would say, well, you know, it's, you know, we don't need to talk about that now. And, um, and, and so, you know, it, it, it's, um, it's never been a movement of clarity in, in large part because it has always been associated with businesses, right. whether they're charitable businesses or whether they're non char you know, they're businesses. Charities are businesses. They're just nonprofit. Um, and it doesn't mean people don't make a lot of money. It just means it doesn't turn a profit. But people are making money. People are being paid sometimes quite large salaries. And so, but I think part of the problem's always been and continues to be <coughs> that these organizations are businesses. And they don't need you to be informed right. or educated they don't want about you to be something. Informed. All they want you to do is be emotional about it or outraged about it. And so many people in the animal movement then and probably now yeah. had a copy of Animal Peter Singer's Animal Liberation on their shelf. They'd opened it. It had pictures. If that book did not have pictures, nobody would have I read know it. it would not have had the impact that it did because everyone opened up, looked at the pictures. Perhaps they hadn't seen it before. We have to remember this is in the 70s that this, this came out and um, th th there wasn't as much information that had been commonly available. And they look at this picture and they think, I don't like that. And then they say, OK, someone fix it. And someone sends them a mail and says, send us your 15 bucks and we will fix it on your behalf. And you never read the rest of the book because you didn't need to, because someone said, I'll do it on your behalf. So it, it, it's bizarre 
how many times I've I've seen reactions from people when people are talking about utilitarianism. Uh, Gary's been talking about utilitarianism and Peter Sing Singer's theories. Like, what are you talking about? He doesn't believe that animal rights. Why are you <laughs> insulting Peter Singer? What's wrong with you? Yeah. The man is a utilitarian. He doesn't believe in, in, in rights, rights generally for yeah. humans or animals. Right. So yeah. of course we have to we have to have more engagement, more responsible engagement with the idea so that we can talk about it sensibly and take on the responsibility ourselves to be advocates. We're not sending someone the 15 bucks through the donate button anymore. It's even easier now because you don't need to send them a check. You just press the button and there we are. But it's taking the responsibility from us. So we never had to clarify our ideas. So as I said, if someone's interested in this subject, go and read that essay in between the species it's a walk through 20 years and what happened okay. and how we don't do it again <laughs> <laughs> yeah okay thanks very much for that it's very interesting okay question from laura who says what is your view on the present rise in supposed vegan and plant-based diets as opposed to veganism proper will it benefit the abolitionist movement in any way or is it a mere fleeting trend who knows um i think a lot of a lot of uh, interest in veganism is focused on health. Um, and, you know, I mean, look, I'm happy people are eating, you know, I, I to the extent that somebody's eating, you know, fewer animals or whatever, I'm happy. I'm not going to promote the idea of reducitarianism or whatever, um, because I think it's fundamentally corrupt. But uh, I think a lot of people are eating fewer animal products because they're worried about health issues. Um, you know, will that be sustained? I don't know. Yeah, maybe. I mean, it's it's not. I mean, the only way you're going to really get, um, I, I think, a, I mean, it's interesting because there is a co co confluence of things now. Uh, there is an increased interest in health. There is a recognition and it's it's reinforced every single day about how animal agriculture is an ecological disaster and that the single single most important thing you can do, the single most significant thing you can do if you care about global warming is to go vegan. The easiest thing. And, and the people. easiest thing, exactly, you know, um, is to go vegan. I just get I just get such a charge out of people who will spend interminable, interminably long periods of time, you know, separating their garbage and making sure that, you know, this is in this bag and that's in that bag. And then they eat animal products, which I just find bizarre beyond belief. Um, and, um, but, but I think, you know, some people, uh, an increasing number of people, I think are recognizing that they can't help it because the, 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 the data that, that are coming out now <laughs> are absolutely clear that animal agriculture is an ecological disaster. Um, you know, the, the health, material that's coming the, health, the information about health that's coming out now i just anna just sent me an article uh yesterday from the lancet which is the british journal uh british Med the leading british medical journal and it's a very prestigious journal and they had an essay about how um high quality carbs will actually increase your life and that following the paleo diet will decrease you know will, will, you'll have a shorter lifespan and so i think increasingly people are becoming aware of of health as the health aspects of a plant-based diet but but i also think that a large number of people are getting the justice idea that is there's something because remember something veganism is more than just what you eat it's what you air what you eat what you wear what you use and i think you know the the health issue doesn't address wool um you know the environmental issue is not focused on on you know anything except um you know the basically the, the the dietary aspect of it but it's it's veganism understood as an ethical idea particularly the abolitionist vegan position which focuses on uh all eating wearing or using of animals and, and that it's unjust and i i think it, it's interesting because um i think a lot of people see that and um and for an increasing number of people they're beginning to see that um you know, and, and understand that they've been sold the bill of goods, that what's, you know, it's that, that veganism is not an extreme thing. What's extreme is that non-veganism, non-veganism involves um, violating fundamental moral principles that they agree with. 
they may be confused about, but that they basically agree it's wrong to inflict unnecessary suffering on animals. Well, if you believe that, you're committed to veganism. Um, and that it's unhealthy and that it's an ecological disaster. Uh, so I think an increasing number of people are, are, are seeing that. I don't know if, you know, I, I just, I don't know, um, you know, whether or not, you know, uh, I, I, there's really no way to know whether or not, you know, uh, a lot of this stuff is, or aspects of it are trendy. I just don't no, know. Right. You know, it, it, you just, you just don't know. I think it's, um, You'll, you'll find a lot of people who are, um, I don't find a lot of people who are actually vegan um, for health reasons. I mean, predominantly vegan or something, but it's not. I've never, right. Yeah, right. it's not in every circumstance. Well, first of all, you're talking about a diet, as you're saying, not other aspects of your life and consumption. Um, it, it's helpful because there will be more, people will know more people who have followed a plant-based diet and haven't had any medical problems and perhaps even had some improvements in their in their health. So it, it makes um, foods that one would eat as an abolitionist veganism less strange and odd, you know, odd and, and perhaps uh, uh, intimidating or something. So perhaps if people are have more experience of people who are not eating animal products, it makes it less of a hurdle to get over when they're presented the ethical argument but they still need to be presented the ethical argument for it to stick and and become an abolished in, in, an argument in the 36 years i've been doing this i have never ever ever met anybody who is a dietary vegan consistently for health reasons or is a dietary vegan because for health reasons that's all they're going to be is the dietary right. vegan um and I've never met somebody who is a dietary vegan for ecological reasons. Um, the only people I've known over these years, and I've known lots of them, who are consistent vegans, they don't eat them, they don't wear them, they don't use them, are people who have got the ethical, you know, who understand the ethical aspect of it. I mean, I guess the only way it would really benefit abolitionist veganism is, is if um, people who went uh, on a plant-based diet or whatever for health reasons, uh, eventually that somehow led to being a, a vegan right. in, in, the true, in the true sense. And I think that's one of the arguments that reducitarians uh, employ. They, they maintain that, that that happens. You know, people go plant-based, then they suddenly see the light as regards to ethical veganism. Um, personally, I don't buy that, but I, I guess some people do. But I don't think it's a uh, well. The I guy, the guy, who, the, the lead carnival barker for the reduced area thing. The guy yeah. who's what I forget his name. He's not a vegan, he so, not so work for him, it hasn't so. worked for him. <laughs> well, he, 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 wants, he wants to change change the definition of veganism to suit his argument. So I mean, that uh, can work, can it? That's right. Well, okay. Yeah, well, I guess, I guess, I guess you can do okay, it that way too. They can go and do their yeah. thing. We yeah. do plodding along relentlessly We're doing our with, thing. We're with doing abolitionist our vegan advocacy. Uh, just getting back to the previous topic, we've got another a supplementary question from Anne who asked about uh, about the, uh, the street theatre. She says um, her local activists are focused on SICs and street theatre. Do you have the most tactful way to explain that this is counterproductive? In other words, what will be your tactful argument to, to these people? You mean to the people who are engaged in that stuff? Yeah. To, to my experience is, my experience okay. is, you can't talk to those people. Yeah, they're probably not okay. such a I place mean, where they're I not. Guess, you can't talk to them. I, I mean, think for the reasons that they got attracted to that way of doing it, it, it it's the you know the emotion and that 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 perspective is very strong. You're probably not going to talk them down from it, as it were. Uh, but uh, uh, you know, um, I hope something will rub off and they'll. They'll change their tactics. I mean, I don't think it's the best way of educating. There, there was, there was, you know, there was a, a few weeks. I mean, just take a look at my page sometime to see like how perverse some of these discussions get. I mean, all you have to do is in any way say this is really not a good idea, and you don't have to like call them names or or question their integrity, but just say, look, this is just doesn't make any sense. I mean, I I made the point about some two people who like went up to the Everest or something and were holding wearing masks and holding computers. And I said, this is just bizarre. I mean, what are we talking about? This is not, you know, this is, this is, this is branding. This is, you know, whatever it is, but it's not, I mean, this is not, we're, we're to the extent that we're saying this is what activism is. We're really, I think in many ways, um, 
uh, doing a disservice to activism. And I, and I, instead of getting a discussion about this, I got, you know, I got 83 million people showed up on the page, which I, whom I banned because, you know, they just basically, you know, started calling people names and calling me names, but, you know, calling other people who disagreed with them names. And, you know, uh, it's very hard to get people to, you know, to get those people to have a discussion about stuff. Um, I mean, you know, the irony is the difficulty is not talking to pub the public about veganism. They understand it. They may not go, they may not become vegans, but they, I mean, you can have every day of my life, every single day, I have discussions with some, sometimes larger groups, sometimes smaller groups about veganism. Easy to do. I can start a conversation with somebody about veganism. If you time, any second. Right. If you stand still long enough, I will start a conversation with you about veganism. Um, you see the room clearing when you come in. Oof, everyone's exactly, gone. You know, exactly. I mean, it's just, you know if, if you stand still long enough, I'm talking to you about veganism. Um, the the people who are the problems are the animal people. I mean, those, those are the people who are the problems. You know. So when you say to somebody, geez, you know. You think this is a really good idea? It's like they get angry, they call you names. I mean, it's it's bizarre, you know. I mean, they accuse you of things. I mean, it's, it's ridiculous. This is such a serious idea, such an important idea, and there's so much work to be done. We just need to get step away from the gimmickry. Yeah. And I, I can, I, I'm not, Gimmicks. I'm sure yeah, a lot so. of people go go with the best of intentions and everything, but um, that that modality is gimmickry. So. Um, it's it's not necessarily exciting. It's not something that you want to videotape. It's not theater. It's everyday explanation of this important idea and following through so that it sticks with people and changes people. Yeah, yeah, I tend to agree with you. I think it's uh, uh, discussions with uh, with uh, straight theater fans are very difficult to have. And I, um, <laughs> right. so I, I think I think we can't really help Anne out too much. Here. I think we've just got to. You've got to, to do it to see exactly how difficult it, it actually is. Look, okay. the activism, activism, if you do it right, is really hard work. It ain't entertainment. Right. And that one of the problems is, is that, you know, uh, these these street theater approaches or, or, you know, whether it's the save movement or whether it's the DXE people or whether it's the anonymous people or whether it's the widget people, whatever these it's they're trying to turn it into entertainment that it's something it's an event that you participate in and the answer is activism is very hard you have to educate yourself about um the anthropocentric mess we are in and you have to be able to address that on different levels with people so that you can get them to see the problem and come out of it and it's not a matter of entertainment for, for quote activists, which is what a lot of this stuff is, entertainment for activists. And it has nothing to do with that. Activism is hard work. And we're living at a time where people think that reading anything longer than a tweet is burdensome. And so, you know, the idea, God forbid, of reading a book or reading anything longer than a tweet or a, I mean, I put stuff on Facebook. I swear to God, people I can put about you know, the people complain about can you the give length. Me a synopsis? You know, exactly. No, they'll, that they'll was the synopsis. Send me a private message. That's a really interesting post. Can you boil it down? And the answer is no. I can't. You're going to have to deal with the you know the the 300 words. I understand that you know or, you know however many words or 500 words, um, but I mean I'm not kidding you. I mean I get that sort of response. People say you know can't you boil it down? And the answer is no. Sorry, can't. These are important ideas. They're I don't believe they're in you know that they're that that they're complicated to the point where you can't explain them. But I'm saying you can explain anything simply. But um, if you understand something, you can you can explain anything simply. But um, but I also think that you know it's a little more complicated than you know than than a tweet. Um, and it requires that you like spend a little time and discipline yourself and learn something. And, you know, I understand that that's like not popular these days with a lot of people and they'd rather go for the entertainment and the instant activism. I don't have to do anything. I can just show up, put my mask on or I can show up and go into the restaurant and scream and yell or I can show up to the 
the middle of the town and put my matching t-shirt on and hold a dead animal or any one of the, you know, the, the, the absurd sorts of things that people are doing. Um, you know, it's easy to do. It's, it's, you know, you have a sort of sense of a camaraderie. It's a sort of a semi, it's a social event. Um, it's got, in my judgment, it, it's not what activism is about. Okay. Okay. Thanks. Uh, just dodging back to the, the Tom Reagan question earlier, a uh, supplementary question from Holly, who asks, is there a good place to find all the history of the animal rights movement? Ha, no. Um, unfortunately, there really isn't. Um, Richard Ryder wrote an interesting book called Animal Revolution. But that's, that's now quite old. I think right. that he wrote that in 1990, maybe even before, but that's pretty old. I mean, Rain Without Thunder, a book I wrote in 96, sort of talked about the history of the movement in the 1990s and how it was sort of going from a rights orientation to a welfare orientation. Um, unfortunately, there, there, there really isn't, um, uh, uh, you know, a, a history that um, there are some books that, you know, um, that deal with or that purport to. To, there, no, there isn't. There really isn't. I mean, there would, there, really would there be a, web, a website uh, that you that you're aware of that, that contains that draws together links to to various things that comprise this sort of history? Your books, Tom's books, and this kind of thing. We no. should, you should republish the link to the the between the species. Yeah, I'll, I, mean, I'll, that, I think that will be use, useful for most people to see how the the rights idea you know reared up before. Uh, and was really quashed in, in at least attempts were made and how we can do it differently really this time yeah i mean i'll 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 re i'll reproduce the link on on the facebook page of the of the article about tom um because i do think that that i i think that that is a right. a good sort of snapshot of that time what's interesting is you know history is written by the the victors that's what I was about to say. Is you know, that you're, his, not, you're going the um, I can think of books about campaigns and right. things like that, but that's for the the people who are doing the single issue campaigns, some of which we participated in. You know, but that's not, oh god, yes. that's not where we, where we need to be going forward. <laughs> yeah. So it, there are books about the Silver Spring Monkeys, and there are books about things yeah. like that, um, which was not the right approach. Yeah, history is written by the victors, and basically, you know, the 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 welfare movement, the the um, happy exploitation movement, the, you know, those are the people who are, so those are that, those are the organizations with the money. And um, much of what's been written has been written by people who are sympathetic or even involved in those organizations, just to give you a sense of how, 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 how messed up it is. If I think there are probably a handful of people who know who Louis Gompertz is, now, Louis Gompertz was an 18th century guy who started an organization in Britain that eventually became the RSPCA. But when he started it, the, I, think, I don't remember, I think he called it the English Society for Animal Protection or something like that. But Gompertz was a, a fascinating guy. He was a vegan. As far as I can tell, he is one of the few really clear, you know, he was a vegan. He didn't think you should wear wool either, but he had no. He, he really didn't have a lot of choice. I mean, he wore wool, but he thought there was it was no wrong. microfiber. At you the know, time. there was no <laughs> microfiber. Um, Probably and not a great deal of cotton either. Exactly, either. exactly, exactly. And he was so opposed to animal use that he actually made dramatic improvements on the design. He was an engineer. He was a, he was a very smart guy, and and he made dramatically. Uh, he made dramatic improvements in the design of the bicycle because he refused to ride horses or to, to ride in carriages that were that were driven by horses. This guy was ahead of his time by hundred, you know, by a long time. Most people don't even know who he is. What's interesting is he forms this society and then he ends up getting thrown out of it because he was a vegan. And nobody, you know, everybody was upset about his veganism. And, um, you know, these were people who liked animals, but they ate animals. And a lot of them were wealthy people who thought fox hunting was just grand and whatnot. And they ended up throwing him out of the society that he helped to found. And the excuse they gave was that 
you had to be Christian and he was a Jew. And they, 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 so they passed some idiotic ordinance that said that if you wanted to be a member of the society, you had to be a Christian. Oh, unfortunately, sorry, Lewis, sorry, Lewis <laughs> you're a Jew go. Um, and they threw him out. And it's interesting because I don't think I've met more than a handful of people who even knew who Gompertz, who knows who Gompertz is. And, and so, you know, and it doesn't, in certain ways, it doesn't surprise me because history is written by the victors and that, you know, the, the, the vegan position is not the position that's prevailed. Even if you look at the history of the vegan society in Britain. Okay. Um, the the people you know Donald Watson is associated you know is is identified and I have a lot of respect for Watson, but there were people who were far more radical than Watson and they're sort of moved out they're moved they're you know they're 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 sort of marginalized fairly early on. And the women. And the women. Gone. <laughs> well, women are always. Um, but the you know the 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 more the the more progressive. Uh, I mean, Donald, don't, don't get me wrong. Donald Watson was a pretty progressive guy, particularly for his time. He was opposed. He was a pacifist. He was against, you know, he was against military service. Um, you know, he was against war. Um, he was a fairly progressive guy. But there were people who in many ways were far more progressive than Donald Watson. But, you know, when the when you talk about the history of the vegan society, those people are sort of, le you know, they're marginalized. And Donald Watson, who in many ways was more acceptable, um, is becomes the face of it. And so um, history is, you know, as a way of, you know, I mean, we really haven't had um, uh, the, the, the animal movement has been controlled in large part by largely reactionary forces. Right. And we haven't had we haven't really had until now an attempt to have a movement with a strong rights position, an uncompromising right. rights position at its core. Mm. Now, when, when we go back to the, the, the 80s, when the modern animal rights movement in the US and some degree in the UK too, um, got going, it was thoroughly underpinned by Peter Singer's thinking. Absolutely. To the point where people actually made fun of Tom Reagan. Yeah. They, no, no large group sold um, the case for animal rights. I understand it's a somewhat dense book to read. It's not easily comprehensible for everybody but tom's presentations and the tom and gary uh, roadshow that went on in the 1980s presented those ideas in very approachable ways but the the main groups did not want to hear that message Absolutely. i have been in a lot of organizational meetings with people making fun of tom reagan which was really unfortunate so those ideas did not become the underpinning principles of the movement. And that's why we ended up with new welfareism and that whole fiasco. So we need to get educated, each of us, we need to do that work to get the abolitionist principles thoroughly underpinning our perspective on this. So now each of us can have the opportunity to take this new energy, this new access that we all have, because they could shut Tom Reagan out at that point. They can't shut abolitionist principles out now because technology brings us into contact with all sorts of people without the, without the institutional barriers. So we can do it this way if everyone shoulders the individual responsibility of education and advocacy. I mean, you can understand why these groups all gravitated to Singer because Singer's got a philosophy that basically says whatever reduces suffering is a good thing. Well, if you're running one of these organizations, you say, gee, you know, if we decrease the size, if we increase the size of these cages a millionth of an inch, you, you know, dream. it will, you know, it will reduce suffering and boom, you know, and then, you know, we'll get Peter endless Singer. To campaigns. You know, endless numbers. That was the point I made in Rain Without Thunder right. was that when you have a utilitarian perspective, you've got an endless number of fundraising campaigns because they all arguably reduce suffering and they all miss the point all right okay yeah i think i, I suppose the answer really is that if you want to get a, a good thorough history of the animal rights movement you've got a little bit of research you're doing a little bit of digging around there's, there isn't a one to uh sort of one a one-stop place that you, you can go to but yeah. it's, I mean, it's certainly worth 
it's certainly worth doing because it is very interesting. Yeah, it it it, re it, re it really is, and I always yeah. think that you know, in my retirement, <laughs> um, I I might like write you know write a history. Um, no, we're going to be too busy with doing it now. Yeah, exactly. But you know, on the, the other perspective hand, perspective is good, but we know what needs you know, to be done now. Exactly. Exactly. Okay, moving on then. Uh, this is a question from Fair or Fur. I, I'm not entirely sure how you pronounce that. Um, what's the abolitionist view on animal sanctuaries? Should we only support those that are 100% vegan and whose only uh, activity or purpose is rescue? Unfortunately, most sanctuaries become petting zoos. And, um, you know, you have to understand something. You know, these animals a lot of these farm animals are, you know, they're not pets and, you know, they, they're, they have to be quote worked with in order to get them to be friendly to people or, or not friendly because they're not, they're not hostile, but to sort of have them quote petable. And what, what a lot of these sanctuaries um, uh, do, unfortunately, is they become petting zoos. And I think it's a really, really bad idea. Um, we obviously need sanctuaries, um, and and um, but you know, any sanctuary that's worth anything is promoting veganism. You know, it it is very clearly vegan, um, and shouldn't generally be open to the generally right. open to the public. I right. mean, perhaps people should be able to go in yeah. certain limited circumstances. But but you're right, we shouldn't be having a they're petting zoos, right? I mean, you know, you know, these these places should not be open to large numbers of people who are coming through all the time um, and and, uh, you know, quote, interacting with the animals. That's exploitative. It's nonsense. Um, and um, unfortunately, I think that's the model that most of them follow. Um, a, a real sanctuary should basically be a sanctuary. It should allow the animals to live their lives in peace and quiet and not be climbed on by children or you know, fawned over by, I mean, it's just, it's a really bad idea, but that also any sanctuary ought to be promoting. I mean, that doesn't make any sense to me. I mean, why we would have a sanctuary that wouldn't be vegan. Unfortunately, um, I mean, um, what what's really disappointing is when you see um, these sanctuaries promoting happy exploitation and welfareism and whatnot. Um, it, it's, you know, but these are business. I mean, the bottom line is, um, Many sanctuaries, like these organizations, they're businesses. The animals are props in a business. Bad idea. I think one. I think one of the other sad things about this is when you have these sanctuaries and uh, ha having fundraising events that involve uh, animal animal products. They have a barbecue and yeah, you know, people <laughs> around eating, eating the animals that are in the sanctuary. Effectively, yes. I mean that's yeah. very very sense, strange. Well, very strange. You know, it's all. It's always been. It's always been that way. Um, uh, you know, when I, in the 1980s, when I first got involved with this, I was on the board for a very brief period of time of a shelter. And, um, and, you know, it was a shelter where, it, it, you know, it wasn't a no, well, they didn't even have, really even have the concept of no kill. I mean, certainly animals were not killed unless they had medical problems. They didn't, they didn't kill for reasons of overpopulation. It was a very small shelter. But they would have these events where they would, you know, have parties and they would serve spare ribs and they would serve dairy products and they would serve all sorts of stuff to raise money so that they could help the animals. And um, I remember um, trying to discuss veganism with them and having a reaction. I mean, I, I quit. I quit because um, I could no longer stand the absurdity of having the director of the shelter spend X period of time explaining why two animals that week had to be killed because they had medical problems, what medical problems they had, how they tried to f fix the medical problems. Then they had, to, you know, they had to end up killing the animal because the animal, you know, was in pain or the animal had terminal, you know, whatever. and then we would say, okay, fine. Well, you know, the, the fundraiser next week will be at, you know, Joni's house and, and, you know, we're going to have veal and we're going to have, you know, chicken and steak and fish for those people who don't like meat. And, and I just couldn't get over it, but it's been that way forever. I mean, you know, it's, it's, it's been that way forever. Um, uh, I remember, uh, years ago when, um, you know, when, uh, we were living in Manhattan and, uh, 
we're friendly with John Kahlberg, who has since died, but he used to be the head of the ASPCA. And, and he said, you know, it was really horrible when they used to have events. They couldn't, you know, they try to have them in the summertime because if they had them in the wintertime, everybody came wearing fur coats. Now, I don't think that there's any difference between wearing fur coat and wearing wool, but, uh, or leather or silk or whatever. But, you know, it, it, it's bizarre. It's more, it's what I call moral schizophrenia. We think, in, you know, we, we are literally delusional. I mean, in the sense of, I mean, you know, that's what schizophrenia is. It's delusion. It's delusional thinking. And we are delusional when it comes to animal. We really are. I mean, we are literally delusional. And so we can go to an event where, you know, we're celebrating an organization that, you know, saves, you know, saves dogs and cats, or we think saves dogs or cats. And, and that on, at the same time, you know, we're eating animal products or whatever. It just, just doesn't make any sense. And this is, but you know, the good side of this is people care about animals. That's a good side. Good side is lots of people care lots about animals, but they're confused. And that's what our job is to unconfuse them, to give them clarity, to help them, to help them think clearly about the issues. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. I've got a related question here from Chad, uh, and I've got to change this question slightly because I think I, I think it. I'm going to divide it into two halves. First of all, do you think that um, shelters who deal with adoption, and, and I'm thinking particularly of dogs and cats and, and animals that are commonly regarded as, as pets, uh, do you think they should at the same time advocate for the end of domestication? Yes. Hmm. What do you mean? I'm not sure I understand. What well, there, there, there's a strange, there, there's a strange, a bit of a dichotomy here because if you are if you are putting animals up for for adoption. You are effectively, effectively saying tacitly that it's okay to continue with domestication because you're giving people animals to domesticate. No, no, no. You got to be clear about that. Yeah. We have animals that are in existence now. They need homes. Right. So we need to. We these are these are animals that are highly socialized animals, and um, they're they're domesticated to the extent that they cannot care for themselves if we don't. I mean, you know, they're dependent on us for every aspect of their lives. I love our dogs. They shouldn't exist. I mean, I really love them. They shouldn't exist. Um, and and so, yeah, I think that shelters, you know, we need to, you know, we, we should adopt animals. They need homes. They're in this mess because of us. We have an obligation to take care of them. But we also have an obligation not to bring any more of them into existence. Right. So, you, so you, what you're saying is, you think that shelters, while while they are while they are trying to get animals ad adopted, they should also take the view and to tell people that domestication is wrong and, and uh, along the lines. Absolutely, yeah. there is no such thing. There is yeah. no such thing as responsible breeding. Right. It's a uh, it's a fantasy. I think the majority. I'm I'm sure the majority of of shelters now uh, require. Um, animals adopted from to be spayed or neutered. I right. mean, there may be some that don't. Um, I think but most do. The, most do with a clear message that <laughs> that the situation, um, uh, you know, is is very bad for the animals who are caught up in it. So, but clearly, we have to take care of the ones that are here. Yeah. Say the six ones at my feet. But, right. um, the the, se the second part, of Chad Chad's question, really relates to to. Uh, this, this advocacy that we were we were talking about, and whether or not by by taking this line, they they actually spoil their chances of getting animals adopted because it kind of puts people off adopting them. What? What do you mean? Bit of speculation. If you if you if you're advocating that domestication should cease, could that not have the effect of of uh, putting off potential potential adopters because they then say, oh yeah, I see what you mean. I won't adopt a, a dog or a cat. Or but whatever. that's not the message. I mean, the message. The, the, but that's not the message. I mean, if it if it puts them off, it's because they've misunderstood the point. Right. I, it's it's. I, I've had a few. I've seen a few examples of that. People making comments like that on the Facebook pages. Yeah. It's just, it's a, it's a complete misunderstanding. I'm sure the shelters need to be focusing primarily on getting. Uh, good homes, uh, you know, where they can uh, pretty much guarantee as much as possible that those those animals will have a better future than their past has been. Um, but but sure, certainly um, everyone should be doing it in tandem where there's a clear message that this this is a problem that needs to be addressed and fixed by the end of uh, of domestication. So 
perhaps it's not the most efficient, the best time, I don't know, uh, to, to have the domestication. You certainly don't want to seem hostile or something to people walking through the door and faulting people for wanting to, ha to take an animal away. But um, there must be a way of, of them encouraging the efforts to, to shed light on the problems of domestication. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Okay. Well, thanks for that, Chad. If you're still in the in the room, uh, if I've got that a little bit wrong, please uh, mention it in the chat room, and we'll we'll try and put it right for you. Or I'll I mean, there are there right are right. there are particularly in the United States, there are million today. I believe is clear out the shelters day. It's an effort. Oh, is it? Is yeah, <laughs> it's a it's an effort across the country to get some of these animals um, adopted. So that's that's a very good thing to. I think a lot of adoption fees have been waived, and there you know there are different ways of of getting the animals out to be seen. Um, so we all need to be doing our bit for people responsibly to take on um, the adoption of an animal if they're in a position to do so responsibly. But it is you know a responsibility. The six that we have here, many of whom have come from very bad circumstances, are are a, a considerable responsibility um but it, it's certainly a, a, an important part of advocacy too we this they're in this mess because of us and uh if we're able to make the life of individuals better because this is about the suffering of individuals we should be doing it okay thanks okay next question comes from nicole and it's uh, it's about uh sort of uh, what is necessary and what is unnecessary uh and she says what about people who live off the grid does that dictate the necessity of animal use for survival? We mean people who live off the grid. You mean people? Well, I guess who... I guess there are some people that that are that are perhaps ex ethnic groups uh, living oh. in circumstances that uh, they find uh, perhaps uh, using animal use necess necessary and this kind of thing. Uh, ah. I, I guess there are also people who people who live in in um, uh, countries like the UK, US, who, who actually live off the grid. In other words, they they live apart from society who, who may find that they need to uh, use some sort of animal products in order to, to live off I the grid, as it were. I think part of this is the Inuit question. <laughs> is this the Inuit question? Well, yes. that, the Inuit um, spring to mind, yeah, certainly. Right, right. well, a lot, um, it would be a, a strange um, lecture, presentation or animal, you know, focused meeting where the question of what about the Inuit didn't come up. And because, um, <laughs> Inuits and, always and come. I, I, you have you have been posed that question by, by people <laughs> of Inuit yeah. extraction. I never have, but I've been post posed that question many times from people who live in very comfortable suburbs and have no problems, <laughs> right? Um, uh, going forward without using animal products, but want to point to that problem as a reason why they shouldn't do it. So that's the usual distraction of that question. There is a real question in there though so i'll i'll uh, focus on that one um I, I think this is a this is a moral imperative for everyone um i understand that it's going to be easier for some people talk about domestication this is this is he's finley not, he's not the most comfortable yet this is finley who is a blind and deaf shelty um who is a result of breeding where people know that some of the litters will be blind and deaf, but they're oh so pretty and white, and he's a white color. What happens shelter. is you take a merle and you you cro you you breed a merle with gray shelty with another gray shelty, another merle. You try to get a white shelty because they make a, you know, they you can charge a huge amount of money. And this guy twenty five percent of them are blind or deaf or both. And he's both. And he's both. And he was going to be killed. And um, we took him. Boy. He's a lovely boy. Communication with him is a little challenging, I can tell you. <laughs> but he's a lovely dog. And um, he's a really lovely dog. But he's a perfect example of, of uh, what's wrong with domestication. But, um, you know, I think, um, uh, first of all, there's a lot of, uh, um, I mean, you, you know, the Inuits or in, in a lot of these indigenous groups, you know, it's not that, you know, they, they're getting flights of, you know, they're getting planes going in every day, bringing stuff, bringing food and things like that. Um, so, you know, this idea that, you know, they have to 
you know, kill whales or whatever, I mean, is, is, um, is nonsense. And so people say, yeah, but wait a minute, it's part of their culture. And the answer is sexism is part of culture. Is that okay? Uh, all sorts of bad stuff, you know, uh, genital mutilation is part of some people's cultures. Is that okay? Um, and, and, um, you know, so this idea that something's cultural and therefore you can't criticize it is just bullshit as far as I'm concerned. Um, the issue is whether it's right or wrong. And the fact that it's part of somebody's culture is irrelevant because everything is part of somebody's culture and everything bad is part of somebody's culture. So, you know, and I, I mean, again, I think sexism is a perfect example. Sexism is part of culture. It's part of everybody's culture. Does that make it right? Um, and so when you say, well, somebody's living in a situation, I mean, uh, you, you know, you have to, yeah, in a lot of these examples, uh, I mean, let me, let me give you an example of something that comes up fairly often. People say, well, wait a minute now, what about poor people in the United States? Isn't it okay for them? I mean, aren't you being racist because a lot of the poor people in this country are people of color. So aren't you being racist if you say that veganism is a moral imperative for them? And the answer is, well, wait a minute now. Um, if I were to say that um, it's okay if you're a poor person to uh, assault your neighbor to get money because you need it. Your neighbor may need it too, but the point is you need it. And so if is it okay to engage in violence towards other people because you are a poor person? Now, I've never met anybody who says, yeah, that's fine. Um, that it's perfectly fine for people to engage in violence to other people um, and towards other people. Now, I mean, poverty is horrible and, 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 and we need, um, we need a, a a, a more just and more progressive society where resources are distributed so that people are not in situations of dire poverty, because really we would all have to give up so very little. Um, you know, we, we don't need a, a communist dictatorship in order to assure everybody has a decent life. If we all gave up a fairly small amount, um, we, everybody could live a decent life. Um, and, and there've been, you know, lots of things written about that, about how really, if we if we all gave up a little bit and we all stopped spending money on killing people and on on you know and, and wasting huge and huge and huge amounts of money on defense and things like that, uh, people can have a decent life, and that's the direction in which we ought to go, and um, that's the only direction that makes sense in many ways. But this idea that well, if people are poor, it's all right for them to exploit animals is like saying well. If they're poor, is it all right for them to exploit humans, you know, to, to do violent things to other humans? And if the answer is no, it's not, but it's okay for them to, to, to do it to animals, then we're just hearing, then that's just, that's just speciesism. That's just a speciesist argument. And so, um, you know, as Anna mentioned, you frequently hear from people, you know, I live in Montclair, New Jersey, which is a very wealthy suburb that's 12 miles outside of Manhattan. I live in, 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 in Montclair, but what about the Inuit? And the answer is, well, you know, I'll be so happy when it's only the inner one. Right. Exactly. exactly. Everyone else who has ready access to to non animal food is is choosing to eat that way. But also um, we have to remember that it's much cheaper to have a wholesome vegan diet Absolutely. than a meat based diet. Obviously, it's a question of access and all of us should be trying to address the social issues of access within a very, within the inequities of society. We've spoken before about the fact that for 30 years we've been teaching at a university in a very poor neighborhood of uh, in New Jersey, New York, New Jersey. It's not it's um, it's it's a uh, generally a poor city. So access is a challenge, but it's getting better because people are addressing that because people are seeing the importance of getting wholesome, inexpensive food to uh, more ready accessible to people. So uh, we wrote a little bit about that in the how do I, um, in the, the yeah, advocate, advocate for animals, animals yeah. about talking about advocating um, in poorer neighborhoods and perhaps providing some assistance right. and things you and can do to help people get people decent who are food, working yeah. for food justice already in those societies. So we can all do our bit 
um, about getting wholesome food into schools and wholesome food delivered to people who are housebound or elderly and that sort of thing. So that, that, that's something that we all can work on too. Uh, I'll tell you, Alan, many years ago, when I was first starting in this, uh, I was giving a talk and some folks from the Inuits, the Inuit tribe or group came to my talk and uh, asked me uh, how it was that I could criticize their killing of animals and because it was part of their culture. And I said, um, and, and they said, because I was not part of their culture, I could not criticize it. And, um, and I said, well, let me ask you a question. If child sacrifice were part of your culture, would it be all right for outsiders to criticize? And they said, well, yes, of course. I said, well, then we all agree that outsiders can criticize your culture. It's just we're having a discussion about speciesism. You think that if cultures involve violent actions towards humans, they can be criticized. If cultures don't, you know, if it involves animals, then, then you can't criticize it. But that's not anything but a statement about speciesism. And, um, you know, and, and again, I mean, you know, it, 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 some of this, you know, can get complicated, but I think uh, it becomes simplistic to the point of being um, silly when, you know, the reaction to statements about um, rejecting speciesism sort of get labeled as, well, it's racist or it's, it's colonialist or it's this or it's that. Um, those are labels which um, indicate people aren't. I mean, I, I'm happy to discuss these things with anybody. Uh, they tend to be a way to shut down. They tend to, yeah, they it's tend like, to be a way to shut it's down. It's like almost a dare for yeah. you to engage because you're being labeled as racist or neocolonial or something like that. Now, the person who's the the the, the person who comes from an Inuit background is coming to a lecture in an urban area in Canada or something. It is it not exactly Canada. It wasn't Canada tied to the land in that way, right. but they're still using, you know, the cultural tradition as a defense, but that let, let's transpose that to plenty of other examples. And we'll see that it we wouldn't hold in those. I mean, go and watch gone with the wind. If you've got some time tonight, <laughs> you want to talk then, about culture <laughs> and, and, you know, let's have a, uh, tug on our heartstrings about the culture of the South that was going on. And, and that was, that's, that's important. I mean, Gone with the Wind is a perfect example yeah. of this because the whole point of that book and that movie was to sort of. The was, gracious time yes, that's gone. Yes, it was this time mm, that was gone, that is society. gone with the wind. You know, it was this slave based society. It was, it was the, the old South yeah. that had gone with the wind. And, and um, it was a celebration and it romanticized this. I mean, actually, I think Gone with the Wind is one of the most offensive Absolutely. movies that has ever been made. Right. Um, and and um, and so, you know, uh, all of these things are part of somebody's culture that people, you know, that that's that's valued. And I, I remember once many years ago being on a radio show not having to do with animals in which I was talking about cultural relativism. And I was arguing that, you know, people defend female genital mutilation. And I had people on that radio show arguing with me that female genital <laughs> mutilation was, you know, was defensible. And I'm sorry, but you cannot, if, if a woman chooses, whatever that means, to participate in that, that's different. When you're talking about female genital mutilation inflicted on eight-year-old girls, I'm sorry. <laughs> I don't care what anybody says. That's wrong. Um, and, and so, you know, and, and, to, and if you're going to be a cultural relativist and say, well, it's right for them, I'm sorry. I mean, you know, that's just, that's just silly. I mean, I know it sounds edgy and cool and hip and progressive, but it's not. No, when, once you've taken the step of hurting, harming someone else, whether yep. human or animal, yep. then other people have a voice and a perspective. Exactly. Okay. Do you ever see any circumstances where, um, animal use, although it may be unnecessary, could be considered morally excusable. Morally excusable? Yeah. Well, desert, I thought desert islands always yeah, going back to desert islands. There are desert islands. I mean, the, I mean, I think I think human. I mean, look, it, you know, if you're on a desert island, if you and I are on a desert island, and you know, I'm in a weakened condition, or you're in a weakened condition, and one of us kills and eats the other one, it's not morally justifiable. It's not right. But it may be morally excusable because there's a compulsion there. I mean, I think 
the only situations in which you can talk about moral excuse are situations of compulsion. I, I actually have some sympathy for people who have, if if you have the hypothetical cat who's going to die if you don't feed the cat some animal product. What do you do? You're sort of, that's a sort of a desert island situation. There's a compulsion there. What really used to annoy the hell out of me was I would be giving a lecture and somebody would say, well, you know, how do you deal with vegan cats? And then I would always say, are you vegan? And they would say, no, 90% of the time. And I'd say, well, what the hell are we talking about the cat for? Um, because, you know, this is just a, you know, this is, this is silly. You're wasting time. Um, but, you know, I, I think that uh, there can be situations the desert island situation, the lifeboat situation, those, you know, situations of compulsion. Um, you know, I think it's wrong to exploit animals, but it might be excusable in that it's wrong, but we understand it. We mitigate the culpability because of the compulsion. But I think those are also situations in which we would mitigate, you know, we would mitigate the culpability uh, because of the compulsion where humans are involved. Okay, thanks. Okay, well, this is uh, looking at the time. This may well be the last question, but we'll see how it goes. It's a question from Carl, who says that uh, he's very shy and has difficulties talking to people face to face. What other ways can he advocate? Well, look, I think we all have an obligation. Anna's a very shy person, and um, and I think that that you know she had a really sort of you know. Uh, overcome that in order to to advocate, and um, and I think a lot of people are shy. Um, at, at some point, I mean, I, at some point, I think we need to 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 say, look, um, we're not the ones who are in the cages and the slaughterhouses and the horrible situations, and we need to do whatever we can to sort of um, get out there and advocate, and and. Uh, but everybody can do it. I mean, even if you're not comfortable doing it in large groups, I mean, I assume Carl has, you know, I mean, I mean, look, Carl's not, Carl ha interacts with people. He may not be comfortable interacting in large groups. He may not be comfortable advocating in certain situations, but he is comfortable advocating in some situations and being in some situations. You know, not everybody has to advocate the same way. The message has got to be the same, but people can, can advocate in, in, you know, different ways. I mean, as Anna said before, the most important form of advocacy is what you do in the groups that you're, you know, that you're part of, your friends, your family, your school, your work, your church, your whatever it is, um, you know, the, whatever social groups you participate in. And I assume that Carl participates in those. And if he, if, if all Carl does in the next year is get one of those people turned on to veganism, Carl's doing great. What do you think? I think it's um, one of the reasons I do the webinars and things because I think people can see that um, everyone can can talk about this really. Um, one thing that uh, Gary's right, I'm not the most out there person. Um, I find it most comfortable in when you sort of take on a, a, a role, role, as it yeah. were. I, and I've, I've talked about this before. I mean, I'm a lawyer, I spent my life teaching. Um, but it's kind of a role. And, um, you know, I will be someone who dies at a cocktail party, but I can I can be a lawyer. But it's it's sort of you put it on with the suit, you know. I'm sorry, I took your thing. It's, she gets it's violent. You're doing a job. And if you can take it, if you can sort of view it like that, sometimes it takes the personality out of it. But it doesn't, even if we're shy, I mean, it, I, I don't know, the question is, personal circumstance and uh, there may be a mental health issue that I have no expertise in and very little perspective. So I'm sure there are some people who are, find it difficult in a way that we're not even talking about. But just shyness is something that we can all work around. Now with technology, there are ways to talk to people, to reach people that are not verbal, you know, so you can hit your keyboard in a, in a constructive way. You can, um, get materials out there. You can go and make sure that your library has got um, ab abolitionist materials in it. Go and ask them to, to go and put, you know, go and ask the library to order good books so that you're, you're, you're getting you know, a different interface with people. You're getting materials um, available to them, not in the one-to-one -one 
sort of interactions and you can do that in your high school and you can do that in in your universities and things like that there are ways of getting materials out there um but also this is something i think that we need to do even if we're not terribly comfortable about it because it's not about us and um our lack of comfort is nothing compared to the um suffering and the inequities that we are addressing so I think we need to do it even if we don't feel like it and if it's not comfortable at the beginning. It gets a lot easier the more you do it. And, uh, you know, I think public speaking is like the number one dread that people have. Yeah. Uh, you, the, the idea of, you know, going around a room and being introduced, you'll get CEOs who would say that's the most awful thing that they waiting to be introduced is a frightening thing, even people for people who have a public life. So, um, you know, I think we need to face the fact that sometimes putting ourselves out there can be a bit nerve wracking, but we need to do it anyway. And you'll usually find out that, you know, you didn't die. Um, you didn't have, you're not going, someone thinking badly of you is not going to ruin your life for the rest of it, rest, rest of your life. An interaction that didn't go just the way you would have planned it is, is not, that's not the important thing. The important thing is the interaction. And you can become you get a, very good, a yeah. very good advocate because the, the genuineness of your presentation is just a, a glib, slick presentation that you've given 50 times and you're not listening to the other person. A true interaction may be something that the shy person is really good at. Um, and, and you can always you can always get better. Let me let me tell you a quick. I've been teaching since night since the mid 1980s. And. Um, I've had lots of students who are terrified about speaking in a large group of people because right. I teach classes where there, you know, there's a hundred people and, and some people are just terrified of speaking in a large group like that. So when you call on them, they freeze. And I've had students, you know, I'm, I start teaching this coming week. I've got, you know, 200 people now they're divided, you know, amongst three classes, but uh, they're, they're big classes. And what I always do when people come, because they have uh, for years and years and years, come to me and said, I don't know what the hell I'm going to do. I'm, I mean, I'm, the idea that you're going to call on me one of these days, you know, I, I, I might, you know, just end my life before that happens because I can't stand the thought of talking in a large group. And what I always say, to, well, we go and, and I have like things that I do with them. Like I, um, I tell them. Okay, we're going to do this. I'm going to ease you into it. Okay. Um, My deaf boy? Yeah, that's our, that's our, our deaf boy. He, he, he doesn't often, he doesn't understand how loud he's barking. Um, and and um, so what I do is I, I do things like, okay, I'm going to call on you, but this is the question I'm going to ask you. And we go through it. And just and then they'll they'll we 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 play it in class. I call on the person. The person we have the exchange that we've practiced before. And you know what? I've had very few circumstances where people who have gone through that haven't become very well a lot more comfortable. I mean, not super happy, but they've gotten comfortable about speaking in a large group. This is something you can learn. People who are absolutely terrified about speaking in a large group can can overcome that. And so, you know, I mean, whatever uh, Carl's situation is, uh, there are ways around that. And, you know, I mean, and one of the things that, you know, that Carl can do is he can work with somebody who sort of does role play advocacy so that Carl gets comfortable doing it. We've, Just actually, a matter we've, of actually, we've talked, actually, we've actually talked about that. About, and I, might, yeah. I might do something because people think, oh, if she can do it, anyone can do it. But uh, watch the watch the Facebook page because we've actually talked about perhaps having some sessions on a platform that don't go onto YouTube or whatever. So it's a private um, like you, seminars, set, like, like seminars, you know, just, just working with people. Discussions about, about yeah. something so that you get ideas and encouragement and it's not in a public setting and no one's going to be judging you and saying anything like that. So um, that might, if we get some time, 
um, just just watch the, watch the Facebook page. We might. And one one of the things we've talked about is working with people who have issues like Carl's because he's not alone. Right. <laughs> you know right. about hey, I you know I'm I I I'm not I'm shy. And the answer is what that really means for most people. And I'm not speaking for Carl and there, there could be other situations, but what that means for most people is they just don't know how to speak in groups. That's because they've never had that experience. But like most things you can learn. Right. Well, I think, I think Carl's situation is probably in the majority rather than being unusual. Yeah, it doesn't, maybe. it doesn't, it doesn't relate to your personality. As you say, it just, Relates to your lack of experience. Right. Yeah, um, it's exactly. Exactly. Course, You'd be knowing, surprised. Knowing, knowing the subject, of course, is, is is a great deal of help as well, which a lot of people have to educate themselves about uh, advocacy before they can even approach being confident about it. Exactly. In so exactly. I, I think seminars and role plays are a brilliant idea. And, yeah. uh, you know, good and good for you if you can if you can do that. Um, I suppose the the obvious alternative to uh, public speaking is online advocacy, which yes. Anna mentioned. Yeah. Oh, and of course, that does have its drawbacks, doesn't it? I mean, you lose the personal touch, you lose tone, you lose body language. And of course, it's a lot easier for people to have an argument with you on uh, over the Internet than it is face to face. Sure, sure. No, no, look, uh, the, the things that Carl's talking about, they're valid. They're really valid. And you're right, Alan, they are, you know, they're more common than uh, not common. But um, but it is a matter of learning things. I mean, I, I have to tell you this. Some of the best students I've had in terms of people who have become wonderful classroom participants started off very shy and had to go through this sort of thing. And then once they learned and they saw that, you know, they could do it, they could actually, once they had the experience of saying something in front of 100 people and not having, you know, not not having the world end, um, it, it's remarkable to see how some of those people blossom, many of them actually. Okay, brilliant. Well, thanks for that. I think we've uh, we've just about reached the end of uh, our two hours. Um, we've got a few messages from the uh, from from uh, the room tonight. Uh, Juan Paolo says, "Thank you for everything, Gary and Anna. Eternally grateful for your work and dedication." Fur says, "I've been devouring your books over the last weeks. I hope you put plenty of tomato ketchup on them. Uh, <laughs> just brilliant, just brilliant. We needed to spread the message." Anne says, "Thanks to everyone for the ideas and support." Nicole says, I'm so glad I joined this webinar. Thank you all so much. Laura says, uh, so enlightening and encouraging. And Ka finally, Kylie says, always great to hear Gary and Anna talk. So well, I'd like to thank you, Alan, Thanks, everybody. for, for thanks, arranging Alan, this, for, for everyone who's it. been dealing with the questions. Uh, we really appreciate the work that everyone put, puts in around these webinars. Yeah. I okay, yeah. just want like to thank also our uh, uh, Francis, who's been beavering away in the yeah. in the. Uh, on the control panel here, keeping everyone in check. Francis, uh, who designed our new pamphlets. These yes, these, these Francis, Francis's five beautiful yeah. pamphlets. Okay. And our, our moderators who've been online dealing with questions uh, is Christina, Jeff, Jenny, Sandy, and Vanda. Have all Lovely, been wonderful Thank people. You Thank, Thank you all, all very, very much. much. Okay. So thanks very much again, Gary. Now we look forward to the next one and we wish you all a very good night. Get out of there. Peace. Bye. Thank you. Good night. Good night. Bye. Bye.